a 55 year old male presents with tachypnea and mental confusion blood glucose was 350 mg per deciliter so that is hyperglycemia ph is 7 so what is it is it normal or abnormal yeah when we discussed this question many students immediately said it's normal yeah ph 7 there might be a confusion so neutral ph right so they tend to think it's normal we I mean have in mind normal arterial blood ph is 7.4 so here there is a decrease in ph so there is some acidosis uh, read the next statement urine showed presence of ketone bodies what is the most likely acid base disorder and they have given you a picture this is rotheras test as i discussed in the last week recent mcq discussion this means the purple ring means it's rotheras test and this is a test done for ketone bodies whenever ketone bodies accumulate in the circulation ketone body example is acetoacetic acid yeah which gets dissociated into acetoacetate anion and h plus okay so this anion concentration increases and what does this h plus do h plus reacts with any bicarbonate that is present in the plasma utilizes bicarbonate what happens when bicarbonate is utilized it causes metabolic acidosis Okay so diabetic ketoacidosis is a form of metabolic acidosis and uh, who said it as said it's respiratory acidosis right yeah because i think she got uh, diverted or distracted by the statement tachypnea and mental confusion tachypnea is the effect of metabolic acidosis in metabolic acidosis you know hydrogen ion enters into csf respiratory center gets stimulated the person hyperventilates kusmol's breathing so that's a compensatory step done by the respiratory system for metabolic acidosis okay which of the following is an insoluble dietary fiber for some reason neat has got a favoritism towards dietary fibers okay so listen to this carefully uh dietary fibers are dietary contents which are resistant to action by digestive enzymes when will you call something as a source of dietary fiber only when it is not digested by your enzymes in the upper small intestine so when something is not digested by intestinal enzymes undigested substances reach the colon right and in colon it adds bulk to stools so it helps in relieving constipation right that is a, that is the fact behind dietary fiber now these dietary fibers can be classified into two types depending upon whether they are acted upon by colonic microorganisms or not if a dietary fiber can be acted upon by colonic microorganisms you call them as fermentable yeah you call them as fermentable dietary fiber in which case these dietary fibers get broken down to polar substances like carbon dioxide yeah they get uh, converted to simpler forms and these polar substances start attracting water and they become soluble in that water so they are otherwise called the soluble fibers on the other hand you have dietary fibers which are not which cannot be acted upon by even colonic microorganisms so you call them as non fermentable yeah you call them as non fermentable dietary fiber or insoluble dietary fiber and though they are insoluble what they do is the presence of such fibers serve to stimulate mucus release in the large intestine and this mucus release also helps in gi motility this also helps in uh, relieving constipation that's why they included under dietary fiber so what are the two types of dietary fibers one is fermentable or soluble dietary fibers the other one is non fermentable insoluble dietary fibers 
So, one is acted upon by microorganisms, the other one is not. Okay. I will give you examples for both. The first example for soluble fiber is beta glucans. Yeah, beta glucans which are present in oats. You know that, right? Whenever oats are dissolved in water, soon it becomes soluble in water and then it becomes a gooey structure. You can have that in mind. So, it's a soluble fiber. It's a source of soluble fiber. So, it's present in oats, even in barley and mushrooms. Yeah, they are all sources of soluble dietary fibers. Apart from beta glucans, you can also include pectins. So, what are pectins? Pectins are structural, yeah, they are structural heteropolysaccharides and they are principally made up of galacturonic acid. Please memorize all these facts when they can ask you which is an insoluble dietary fiber, they, fiber, they might even ask you this. So, what are pectins? Pectins are structural heteropolysaccharides principally made up of galacturonic acid and they can be manufactured. Yeah, they can be manufactured from unripe citrus fruits. Once they are uh, ripened, you know, pectinases will cleave them. They are no more available. So, they are manufactured from unripe citrus fruits. Why do we manufacture it? Because they act as good gelling agent. Yeah, they act as good gelling agent. So, they are added to, um, I mean, those who bake those who cook must have come across pectins. They, they can be added to jams or anything which you want or uh, compote. So, for such structure, for such items, you can add pectin. Yeah, it's a powdered substance that can be manufactured and used as a gelling agent. So, that is also a source of soluble fiber. And apart from pectins, we have hemicellulose. Okay, we have hemicellulose. Um, and this hemicellulose is again a heteropolysaccharide and it is made up of galactose, mannose and rhamnose. Yeah, it is made up of galactose, mannose and rhamnose and this hemicellulose is present along with cellulose yeah, in plant cell wall and um, that is about hemicellulose and uh, it also includes mucilage. Yeah, mucilage is produced by most of the plants and some microorganisms. And what is very interesting about mucilage is it is present in flax seeds. You know, flax seeds, you know, they help in relieving constipation. And then we say flax seeds help in weight reduction. It's all because of its content of mucilage. Okay, so what are the examples of cell, I mean, soluble fibers? Example of soluble fibers would include beta glucans present in oats, barley and mushrooms. We have pectins which are present in unripe citrus fruits. They are also used as additives and jams. And then hemicellulose, it is present along with cellulose and plant cell wall. And then mucilage which is produced by plants and microorganisms. And this is the one which is present in flax seeds. Now, there is one disadvantage of all these soluble fibers. It is that it can be acted upon by intestinal colonic microorganisms, in which case they get oxidized to form carbon dioxide and water. And when carbon dioxide is formed in colon, it causes bloating. Yeah, it causes bloating. So, if somebody consumes any of these, they complain of bloating. And that is why they have tried finding, finding out something which is soluble. And at the same time, non-fermentable. Yeah, soluble, but at the same time, non-fermentable, which means they can attract water. It adds bulk to the stool. And at the same time, it does not give rise to carbon dioxide. So, it is not going to cause bloating. And that is psyllium husk. How many of you know to bake? Do you all bake or cook? Yeah, develop one of such hobbies you will get to know so much about nutrition. So, this psyllium husk is added in almond uh, breads. Most of the keto diet, yeah, most of the keto diet recipes will include psyllium husk. 
it adds uh, air to whatever they bake okay and additionally they say it adds uh, bulk to stools it helps in weight reduction because it's both soluble and non fermentable so that's all about soluble fibers now about insoluble fibers and non fermentable fibers this includes um, wheat bran yeah it includes wheat bran and cellulose and lignin yeah these are the examples of non fermentable insoluble dietary fibers okay if you memorize this list you will be able to answer most of the questions on dietary fibers so what are dietary fibers they are not digested by our digestive enzymes so they remain unaffected and they reach the colon wherein they add bulk to stools and there are two types depending upon whether they can be acted upon by colonic microorganisms or not and those two types include soluble fibers and insoluble fibers fermentable fibers and non fermentable fibers so fermentable soluble fibers include i remember it with the mnemonic bph benign prostatic hypertrophy yeah that's the mnemonic which i used to remember this list bph stands for beta glucans pectins hemicellulose and additionally the mucilage which is present in flax seeds okay beta glucans are present in oat barley and mushroom pectins uh, uh, it's a gel gelling agent and then hemicellulose present in cell wall mucilage is found in flax seeds non fermentable insoluble dietary fiber includes three wheat bran cellulose and lignin so which of the following is an insoluble dietary fiber what will be your answer come on this comes under bph mucilage so what's answer lignin so a man is ordered by a judge for an alcohol dependency program where he receives a drug which acts by inhibiting an enzyme involved in alcohol metabolism which makes him aversive to alcohol because of the symptoms which appear whenever he consumes alcohol the metabolite which accumulates in the presence of this drug which is responsible for his complaints is it's a very simple question though though it's a paragraph question giving you so many details it's a very simple question easy to answer very good so as far as alcohol is concerned you know alcohol is metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase to form an aldehyde and then an aldehyde dehydrogenase acts on aldehyde converts it into an acid so if it's ethanol which is present in all alcohols which people consume if ethanol is acted upon by alcohol dehydrogenase it forms acetaldehyde and when that's acted upon by aldehyde dehydrogenase it forms acetic acid and uh, this acetaldehyde yeah is responsible for most of the hangover symptoms so what is uh, what are generally hangover symptoms you know people complain of flushing vomiting throbbing headache yeah hypotension palpitation yeah these are hangover symptoms and all these hangover symptoms are accounted for by the acetaldehyde which accumulates in alcohol metabolism and this aldehyde dehydrogenase has got two clinical significances one is aldehyde dehydrogenase 2 isoform is present in mitochondria and that is the one which majorly metabolizes all acetaldehyde which is formed within your body okay and there is an allelic variant of aldehyde dehydrogenase which is 2 star 2 that is it's a second allele of aldh2 yeah it's a second allele of aldehyde dehydrogenase 2 and that is found to have a very high km and low affinity why can't the enzyme that's mentioned what why can't the enzyme that's mentioned to be inhibited here be alcohol dehydrogenase in which case the accumulated product is ethanol ethanol does not cause these symptoms ethanol is just an alcohol which comes out of your body it does not cause these hangover symptoms
does that answer your question okay so it's all about aldehyde dehydrogenase okay so aldehyde dehydrogenase uh, second allele it's it's found to have a very high km and very low affinity for acetaldehyde so a person with this allele will be very least tolerant to alcohol do you understand this they would they would never consume alcohol because I mean, after they consume alcohol for once or twice they know uh, what they have to experience after an alcohol consumption so it's good for them actually so aldehyde dehydrogenase 2 uh, second allele exhibits high km and low affinity so they are very least tolerant to alcohol and the other clinical significance related to aldehyde dehydrogenase is that it is inhibited by disulfiram and you know this disulfiram is uh, uh, marketed in the name of antabuse the tablet is antabuse and this is being given in all alcohol dependency programs yeah wherein first they are given a psychiatric treatment psychological counseling saying it's bad for your health it's bad for your finance so they give all counseling and then when they go out they are given this uh, uh, disulfiram antabuse so even if the person comes out of the effect of psychological counseling and if the person consumes alcohol and if the person has been taking dulse disulfiram what would accumulate acetaldehyde would accumulate and this acetaldehyde accumulation in excess will cause as i said uh, flushing hypotension tachycardia profuse vomiting sometimes there have been cases which have been reported with severe arrhythmias and even death okay but that's very rare so that is about disulfiram being used for alcohol dependency programs acetaldehyde also causes diplopia acetaldehyde also causes uh, tinnitus okay so it causes so many manifestations that the person won't be the person won't be able to consume alcohol uh, any more okay so that's about disulfiram and uh, the other fact about disulfiram is what if the person does not consume alcohol the person has successfully come out of alcohol dependency program the person has changed himself the person is not consuming alcohol at all in that case won't disulfiram have any effect no it by itself has got effects yeah it is found to cause again uh, vomiting metallic taste it causes vomiting metallic taste increased sleepiness and all these are okay they say sometimes it even presents with extra pyramidal manifestations okay and there is also something called as disulfiram related neuropathy so it's not a I mean i won't say it's a completely full proof drug but when compared to alcohol effects i think they it's like a i mean they have weighed against uh, benefits and toxic effects and it's being given so that's about disulfiram and apart from this you know there are few drugs which have disulfiram like effects right so what are the drugs which have disulfiram like effects yeah any one drug you can think of anybody metallic taste this should have come into your mind immediately right metronidazole and apart from this first generation sulfonyl ureas disulfiram like reactions we call it as right so that's exhibited by few drugs like metronidazole first generation sulfonyl ureas yeah example would be uh, tol butamide and then few cephalosporins like cefepirazone griseofulvin so these are few drugs which i can recollect to have an effect uh, which resembles disulfiram uh, following alcohol consumption okay so what is your answer the metabolite which accumulates in the presence of this drug which is responsible for his complaints is acetaldehyde and if they ask you which enzyme does it inhibit what should be your answer aldehyde dehydrogenase